Hi guys, a very good morning and welcome to Power Breakfast. I'm Pavitra Parekh. Those were all of the top headlines that we have for you this morning. So we have lots to talk about. But first up, it is really the global market setup, which, you know, remains in focus. We got another week session on Wall Street. On the back of that, you have most of the Asian markets which are trading with some cuts. What is holding up well and doing really, uh, you know, seeing some strong gains this morning is the Hong Kong market. That one is up 1.4 percent, so 260 points higher there. But for most of the other Asian markets, you're seeing cuts come through. So the Nikkei market is down around 1 percent. That one is lower. Kospi seeing cuts of 7 tenths of a percent. You have Shanghai, which is, you know, absolutely at the flat line right now, but just a minor downtick over there. Taiwan on your screen, like I said, is 7 tenths of a percent lower as well. So largely lower for Asia, but you have Hang Seng, which is of course doing well. Straits also managing to see just some minor green of around a quarter of a percent. Let's also bring the SGX Nifty up for you. It's indicating quite a flat start, but we are around 16 points lower on the SGX Nifty. So let's see how the trading session pans out. That's what's going on in Asia, but let's talk about the US markets as well. Wall Street ended a choppy trading session, quite mixed overnight, so the Dow Jones was flat, but the S&P 500 uh, closed over seven points lower. The Nasdaq Composite was also down, like you can see on your screen, around 56 points lower as well. So half a percent on uh, the Nasdaq and around two tenths of a percent on the S&P 500. We now have uh, CNBC's Kate Rooney, is who's standing by, to bring you all of the action from Wall Street. Recession worries are still keeping many investors out of the stock market, but the selling slowed somewhat compared to the big losses we saw on Monday and Tuesday. The Dow eked out a tiny gain. The S&P closed down two-tenths of 1%, its fifth straight loss, and the Nasdaq finished one-half of 1% lower. Americans are souring on cryptocurrencies. A new CNBC survey found 43% of the country now has a negative view of crypto. That's up from 25% back in March. The high-profile collapse of FTX is a big part of that story. And now we've been told by former executives that in the midst of this spring's crypto meltdown, they were begging founder Sam Bankman-Fried to give up his aggressive efforts to sign Taylor Swift to a sponsorship that would have cost the company more than $100 million. They say he wouldn't listen, but the deal fell apart anyway. That's the action from the U.S. market. Back to you in Mumbai. All right, Kay, thanks a lot for getting us that action from the U.S. markets with crypto was really once again in focus. But staying with Wall Street, here's some interesting data. American consumers are tapping on the are tapping the brakes on spending this holiday season. This as the Federal Reserve's rate hike cycle has you know, begun to impact the economy. After two years of pandemic fuel, double digit growth in card volumes. Bank of America CEO Brian Moynihan said that the rate of growth is now coming down. Meanwhile, Wells Fargo CEO Charlie Sharp says that, and I quote, there is a slowdown happening. There is no question about it. We expect a fairly weak economy through the year. In fact, a CNBC survey also shows that consumer caution around holiday spending is at the highest level that we've seen since 2013. So we have CNBC Steve Leesman now to wrap up all of the highlights of this report. Steve. The All-America Economic Survey forecasting a softish Christmas where consumers watch their spending. And that comes, by the way, after hitting the malls last year with some abandon. I just love this opening chart, which is showing the uh, intended spending over the last four years. Let's go back to 2019. Before the pandemic, we were still in Kansas. Uh, 987 was the intended uh, uh, spending per, per respondent. 2020, the pandemic hits. It falls down to 886. 2021, wallets full of stimulus, cash, and savings goes up above 1,000. And here we are now, down about 11% from last year, $907, above the level of 2020, but not back in Kansas yet, 987. So a soft is Christmas coming down. And you can see that when we look, we ask specifically, are you going to plan, are you going to spend more or less than last year? Take a look at this next chart. And what you'll see is 46% about the same. That was down from 51%. That was again in Kansas there. 41% will spend less. 11% will spend more. Uh, and you can see here some of the uh, metrics here. You want to go back and see when things were really bad. Take a look in 2008 when 37% uh, were just the same, 55% were going to spend less, and only 7% were going to spend more. So not as bad as it was, say, for example, in the great financial crisis, but certainly not as good as we were before the pandemic. Why are people spending less? Well, you can imagine downbeat views on the economy because the economy's in bad shape. Much better, much higher numbers than last year. Inflation's a big factor. 
and not as many being paid less. Interesting number. We'll come back to that in just a second. I want to show you their 41% spending less than the next, the next chart here, which looks at uh, the inflationary impact. We said, okay, you're, not, you're spending less. What impact directly does inflation have? 70% say they're spending less entirely or mostly because of inflation, 27% saying not a lot. One other thing we, we noted here is an increasing use of credit cards that, again, is a reason for some concern, but measured concern. 30% compared to 22% are going to use credit cards or debt that they're not going to pay off immediately to buy holiday spending. It's a big jump, but that 30% is more normal. It was not, it was down to 22 last year because people had a lot of cash. So let the holiday consumer debate begin. We have inflation on the one hand, poor attitudes about the economy, but I just looked it up this morning, 4.3 million employed Americans who have paychecks to spend. So hmm. that's the debate I think right now. All right, Steve, thanks a lot for getting us all of the highlights of this CNBC survey on how consumer spending is really shaping up this festive season. Like we said, it is at the lowest level that we've seen since 2013. But that's what we're tracking globally. Let's talk about all of the cues that you should watch as we get into a fresh trading session. We have our research team with us. Nigel, Vivek and Vaheshta all join us now to prep us up for this trading session. Guys, a very good morning to all of you. And Vivek, coming to you once again, it just does not look like the global Christmas cheer is picking up. Well, good morning. Absolutely right. You know, the Santa rally this year has been missing so far as far as the global markets are concerned. As you mentioned, you know, the U.S. markets are down for the fifth trade session. In fact, even European markets ended on a weak note yesterday, down anywhere between 0.4 to 0.6 percent. Uh, gold prices yesterday, you know, took a U-turn and actually gained a percent. At yesterday, both dollars as well as the bond yields eased off. However, you know, what spells good news as far as India is concerned is the fall as far as crude oil prices continued and you know oil actually oil price actually ended at a fresh low as far as 2022 was concerned Brent futures down over 2.8 percent closer to the 77 dollars per barrel mark now coming closer to the Indian markets quite a few cues that we need to keep an eye out for number one you know the outcome of the Gujarat as well as the Himachal Pradesh elections assembly elections is the one that we're talking about quite important also we have a new listing debut so Dharmaraj crop guard you know this particular IPO saw a very strong subscription of over 35 times and also we when you're talking about the Indian market, the Indian market ended lower yesterday, very volatile trading session. And, you know, this was mainly on the back of the commentary from the RBI policy as well. Now, when you're talking about, uh, you know, the entire market breadth, OMCs were the one that actually outperformed. Realty and IT both underperformed in yesterday's trading sessions, mainly on the back of higher interest rate worries. Uh, so overall, today, it seems like a muted start to the trading session. It'll be interesting to see whether the dip today is bought as well. All right, we'll wait by and see whether the dip is bought or not. Vivek, thanks a lot for that. And now let's hand it over to Vaishra, who has the entire list of stocks that you should keep on your radar as we get into this fresh trading session. Vaishra, good morning. Good morning, Pavitra. Let me start with HCL Tech, which teams up with Intel and Mavenir to deliver critical 5G enterprise technology solutions. The collaboration would help deliver more 5G solutions to IoT and enterprise verticals. Moving on to Aisha Motors, which inaugurates its new CKD facility in Brazil and would have an assembly capacity of more than 15,000 units per annum. Everready Industries has appointed a new CFO with effect from 14th of February 2023. Metro Brands has completed a 100% acquisition of Gravitex Brands, which is engaged in the business of importing, trading, distributing footwear, apparel and accessories under various brands, which include the likes of Phila and Proline. Macrotech Developers has fixed QIP offer Floor price at 1,023 rupees per share, and the company and the selling shareholders may offer a discount of not more than 5% on the floor price. And the date of the purpose of the offer is fixed at 7th of December. And the last stock is Triveni Engineering, which is having a block deal of, up to, of approximately 500 crores. And this comes to nearly 7.03% of the equity, and the promoter entity is the likely seller. Back to you. All right, Vaishta, thanks a lot for getting us that entire list of stocks. We're going to keep these on our radar. Finally, it's over to Nigel, who's tracking all of the cues from the futures and options space. And Nigel, looks like that FII selling continues. Well, that's right, Pavitra. You were saying Santa's not come to town, but the FIs as well, they seem to, uh, you know, the flow seem to be waning in the month of uh, December so far. So yesterday, the net institutional number, look at the FI and the DI together, that was a net sell number from 850 crores. And, year, and in this month so far, I think we had around five sessions. They bought only once. So they have net selling closer 
around 4,500 crores odd. What do the FIs do in the FRO market? Well, we were asking for some shots to be added, right, in the system, and that's precisely what's happened. So there is some shots that, uh, that have got added. They continue to remain net long, but now the short positioning from around 20, 22%, it's moved to around 39% or thereabouts. They are buying calls as well, so you'll say that's positive. However, they're writing calls very, very aggressively. So that's telling you that higher level, uh, the smarter money they seem to be playing for that resistance to hold out, 18,800, 18,850 odd. What are the options data looking like? Well, yesterday, as I said, called writing has taken center stage. So you have the 18,600, 18,700, as well as the 18,800 call. Between them, they added closer on one crore share. So aggressive call writing being seen at those levels. Let's plug in the numbers then. Since the 18,600 call was fairly active yesterday, you plug in the premium, you're getting a resistance closer to around 18,675 odd. On the downside though, we're nearing a bit of a support zone because the 18,500 put has the highest open interest on the put side and the premium out there is around 25 rupees. So that gives you your stop loss at around 18,475. The 20 DMA, that'll be eyed both on the Nifty and the Nifty Bank. If we can hold on to those levels, you know, protect them, then this uptrend is pretty much intact. But that's the first level of support on the downside. The HX50 is suggesting a bit of a pullback. Let's see how we do from there. But keep in mind, today is weekly expiry as well. So volatility will pick up in the final hour of trade. Back to you. All right, Nigel, Vaishta, Vivek, thanks a lot for joining us and taking us through the trade setup. So slightly muted start and then we could see some volatility like Nigel was just pointing out because it is expiry day as well. Hey guys, welcome back. You're still tuned into Power Breakfast and we have been telling you that one of the big cues for our own markets today will be what's going on on the national front. So all eyes are on Gujarat and Himachal Pradesh as counting of votes begins at 8 a.m. today. So CNN News 18's Pallavi Ghosh filed this report on the prospects of the contesting parties in both of these states. Well, the Himachal and the Gujarat election results are bound to have very important national ramifications, just as every state polls do, and also they don't. Let's focus a bit on Himachal Pradesh, because that's one state where the Congress party is pretty hopeful of actually winning the elections. They had a very organized campaign. Uh, they made it very clear that they are not going to be attacking the prime minister because they knew it's going to boomerang on them. Therefore, the focus was on what they called the bad governance of Jairam Thakur. But there were a couple of issues which are very, very important in Himachal Pradesh. And one of them was, of course, the old pension scheme. The Congress party kept on attacking the BJP. You know, Himachal Pradesh has a large number of old population and therefore an OPS scheme becomes a very important poll issue because it's something which affects the running of every household. This, along with what the Congress accused the BJP of inflation and, of course, the plight of the apple growers. But a card which was played by both the BJP and the Congress was that of the women cards. Now, now, both of them made promises. The BJP, of course, for example, said reservation of jobs in private and government enterprises. As far as Congress was concerned, 1,500 rupees into the bank accounts of women. So women voters will play a very, very key role. For the Congress, little hope because the ARP was missing in action. Now, if you look at Gujarat, ARP was definitely not missing in action. Though towards the fag end of the campaign, they certainly became very weary and the steam went off. But the damage has already been done to the Congress. What the Congress's calculation is, last few days of aggressive campaign and the fact that the Congress had very good candidates and especially their hold on the traditional areas like tribals, the Saurashtra belt, has been more or less maintained. That's at least what the Congress claims. Now, for the good, uh, for uh, BJP, it's not a question of winning. It's a question of the margin of win. Their own estimate is that they want to make it at 125 to 135 seats. In the 2017 state elections, the tally had come down to less than 100, which was at 99, because the Congress had worked very well in the Saurashtra area also the Patidar Patel agitation. Uh, the BJP this time tried to get those calculations right, which is why Patidar Patels have been wooed. Hardik Patel, for example, joined the BJP. Aggressive campaign by the Prime Minister and the BJP in the Saurashtra belt, and of course, as always, falling back on the women voters. Therefore, that's going to be the test of how important these state elections are going to be, whether it's going to be a bounce back moment for the Congress party, even if it's in a small state like Himachal and in Gujarat, whether the woman vote bank works and whether the BJP is able to make an intrusion into the Saurashtra belt. 
All right, Pallavi, thanks a lot for getting us the details on where both of these states currently stand and, you know, the offerings and, uh, from, from all of the political parties in both these states. So remember, you should stay tuned to CNBC TV 18 because we are going to get into counting in just minutes from now and we will keep bringing you updates on that front. But for now, let's also bring you an exclusive. Timothy Moore, Chief Asia-Pacific Strategist at Goldman Sachs, has told us that he is optimistic on the prospects of Indian banks as well as the insurance space. He's also quite bullish on cement and the infra sector. So let's listen into that uh, I, I didn't want to enumerate everything but definitely cement is is there and uh, we've we've, we've uh, uh, reaffirmed that I, I was just in Mumbai last week we had our uh, India uh, chief investment officer uh, conference there and spent time with our with our analysts and and, and with various uh, business uh, business leaders and certainly the, the that, that cement uh, all part of that uh, supply chain for infrastructure investment and development uh, we think is is a Generally looks looks very attractive. Uh, we're very much encouraged on the banks. Uh, there's just a we think a terrific story, and our uh, our, our our bank analyst in um, in Mumbai, Rahul Jain, has been very clear about his about his views uh, there. Uh, I think the key story is that we are seeing clearly a recovery in uh, in private credit issuance and private credit demand. Uh, the increase uh, in, in in rates that we've seen, uh, which obviously has been discussed today, uh, suggests that that margins are still uh, are, are still have some 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 uh, potential to expand. On the insurance sector, we we have we have also uh, significant positive views, and then I'd say that we have a broader positive view on the industrial cyclicals. Hey guys, welcome back. You're still watching Power Breakfast and let's talk about the commodity space because there is a lot going on there. So Manisha Gupta joins us to fill us in with all of the action. Manisha. Oh, well, absolutely, Pavitra. Not a dull day. And for the crude oil prices, we have seen a decline for a fifth straight session today. It's trading at the lowest in 11 months. The manufacturing activity numbers from U.S. and Europe have witnessed a drop, and that weighs on. And even as the U.S. crude inventories may have declined, but everything else in terms of uh, gasoline in inventories, heating oil inventories, all have seen a rise. Is the reason you're looking at gasoline prices trading at the one-year lows? Heating oil is trading at September lows, and the distillate prices also are trading at this year's lows now. So weaker energy prices continues for a fifth trade day. But we have seen some strength come back for gold and silver, which gained 1% overnight for gold and nearly 3% of strength for silver. Canada has delivered 50 basis point of a rate hike, signaling a near trend to the tightening. And the markets are anticipating that the European Central Bank and U.S. Fed each will also deliver just about 50 basis points. That is supportive. All right, Manisha, thanks a lot for getting us all of that action from the world of commodities. With that, we're going to wind down on this edition of Power Breakfast. In Asia, barring the Hong Kong markets, which are seeing a near 2% rise, it is all red across uh, Asia. Barring just that market, the SGX Nifty absolutely flat right now, just around five points lower. Thanks for tuning in. Bazaar Morning Call after this break.